Um, welcome, welcome. Thank you very much for coming. Um, it's been four years, I think, um, since Big Red put on an in-person event. Um, we just found our stride. I think we'd done three in the lead up to, in, up to COVID and uh, we were knocked off our stride. So to be back and have so many people in the room is, is brilliant. Um, I'm going to start, it's what, today's all about different thinking. So I'm going to start with some different thinking approach. I'm going to start with the thank yous. Uh, you'd normally do that at the end, but let's start with the thank yous. First of all, um, thank you all for coming. Um, Neurodiversity is very of the moment. It's, um, it's in the press a lot. You'll have seen yeah, uh, the Panorama documentary about ADHD. It's very much of the moment. So I think the topic is being spoken about in society widely. Um, I'm not sure how much it's being spoken about in the workplace. And today's all about how we're taking neurodiversity and how we're moving that into the workplace. So thank you for being interested in the subject. Um, I think you represent the, the forward thinking. Of the um, of the business community. Um, secondly, thank you to my team. So when we decided to do this, I thought it was going to be as straightforward as right. Let's set ourselves up an email drip campaign. We'll press go. A series of six emails will go out. People will turn up. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. If you're planning to do that on anything, talk to us because it takes some thinking. Um, so as good recruitments do, what we did was we created a competition, because we love a bit of competition, and we said who can get the most interest hits the top of the leaderboard, um, and we told the team to get on the phone, get on the email, start spreading the word. And so thank you team, their job on the day-to-day -day basis is to fill jobs, so me distracting them with getting people to this event because it's my passion project, I appreciate their input, so thank you very much guys. Um, it's a really interesting actually, um, the feedback we got through doing that, and mostly enormously positive. Like, lo like obviously, the, the group of people who have arrived here are interested in the subject and want to take this forward. There was, in general, the feedback was was really, really good. We've got um, there's about another 80 people who said I would love to come but can't make the day. So um, there's a big chunk of people who hopefully will get some collateral from today. I think we're up to 50, maybe 60 downloads of Alex's guide. So there's there's real positivity. There's the occasional, if you mind for a second, I'll share an anecdote from the calling. So Hayley, my co-director, is probably the best tele person I've ever worked with. She is, hits everything with total energy. And I'm overhearing a call that she made. And she, that all I heard was, hi, it's Hayley calling from Big Road Recruitment. I'm not calling about recruitment today. I'm actually calling about a free event we're putting on, all about neurodiversity in the workplace. Would that be something you're interested in? And obviously, I'm on the, the other side of the office, so I don't hear the feedback. OK, would anybody in the business perhaps be more interested in this subject? OK, thanks for your time. The other side of that phone call was, no, I can't imagine any scenario I'd be interested in that subject. Second one was, no, I can't imagine anybody in our business be ever interested in that subject. It's like, what the hell's going on there? I, let's give the person the benefit of the doubt. They just got caught rabbit in the headlights. Someone's phoned me up. I don't like it. I don't like being cold called out of the blue, but they forgot the, I'm in a meeting, send me an email. Uh, this is someone else's responsibility. All the standard lines when you get called by a telesales person. Um, so yeah, there's, there's people's minds and objectives to change out there, but you guys, you represent the positive, forward-looking people. Um, thirdly, thank you to Alex. So I picked up this neurodiversity baton last year after meeting Mark. And Alex basically just ripped the baton off me and went, I'm going. Whether you're coming with me or not, I'm going. So thank you, Alex. This is all Alex's work, um, and she's done an incredible job for us. If you haven't downloaded our guide, please go and have a look. I think it's an incredible piece of work, all Alex's handcrafted from scratch. So if you haven't had a chance yet, <laughs> go. <laughs> she hates praise. She hates praise, so this hasn't gone well. Um, and finally, thank you to our speakers. Um, so, Mark, thank you very much for coming and joining us. I met Mark last year. I, in fact, email drip campaigns do work, because it worked on me. So I got, a, I got an email from Mark last year that said something along the lines of, Hi, I'm Mark. I'm setting up this business. I'm on a mission to do this, this, and this. 20% 20, 20 of the population are neurodiverse. And I'm like, I'm in. So I said, give me a call, let's talk. And 
Mark came into our business and spent some time talking to our team and helped us make some alterations and adaptions which have, which have helped our business greatly. Um, Amy, who we'll be speaking, uh, following on to Mark, um, Amy runs, uh, founded and is the, the chief executive of a business called Synaptic Potential. And we're incredibly lucky to have Amy here. Um, Amy is an author um, and a speaker, professional speaker around uh, neuroscience and, uh, I'll get this right, Amy, whole brain potential. Um, so I, I, absolutely not an area of my expertise, but Amy is an absolute voice in this industry and uh, is very, very well respected in that neuroscience. Works with lots of the um, very well-known Deloitte, uh, EY, sorry. Um, lots of very well-known organisations in the UK with their senior leadership teams looking at that whole brain potential. So we're very, very lucky. Thank you, Amy, for coming along. Um, and then uh, to wrap us up, Alex is going to have a few words at the end to tell you a little bit about how um, her journey at Big Red has gone. Hopefully that will leave you with, um, with some thoughts at the end. So um, let me tell you why this is important to me. I forgot the clicker. Wrong way. We went past that bit. That's horrible. <laughs> <coughs> you put that in there. Let me tell you why this is important to me. Um, so 2015, my oldest daughter was diagnosed with autism. Um, and it was like a bolt from the blue. It was like a, an impactful moment. Um, and yeah, we, it was the school who approached us and said, yeah, look, we, this is what we think. We think you should go down the uh, diagnosis route. Um, and I was like, no, she's just, yeah, she's developing a little bit slower than her peers. She's got dyslexia. There's nothing wrong with it. So I resisted it, but the school were really insistent and really pushed on it. So we went down that, that diagnosis route. Um, and let me just, to frame this, let me give you a little insight to who I am so that I can explain why I acted like I acted, because I, I think it's an important thing. So I, um, yeah, growing up, I, I wouldn't describe myself as particularly intelligent, scraped through my GCSEs, failed my A-levels, then scraped through my A-levels, scraped through a degree, just not, yeah, never thought of myself as academically strong, but I think I've always pushed through in life through, yeah, pushing through the difficult times, using my personality to get where I want to get to, influencing people, working longer, working harder, ignoring the difficult things and just pushing on. Um, fit in, um, yeah, be one of the crowd. That's always been my approach to life. And that, that had an impact into how I managed that situation when Eris got her diagnosis. Um, so you go through the process, there were lots and lots of time invested through the, the, the psychologist. But the one thing that sort of was a, I don't know, impacted me more than anything, or the only thing I really took from the final meeting when they said, yeah, we believe your daughter has autism, was the follow-up phrase, which was, but it's borderline. And in the past, you used to call it um, Asperger's or high-functioning. They're phrases that aren't used these days, but the, the psychologist used those phrases with me and said it's borderline. That's literally the only thing I left the meeting with. It was like, it's borderline. It's fine. Okay, she has autism, but it's fine. She's on the border. She can cope. She can survive. So all of the advice we got was to sit her down and talk to her. She was about 12, 13 at the time. Sit down, talk to her about this. And I said, no, that's a label. She'll then become the person who is different and she'll find life harder. She'll find hard, harder getting a job. She'll find it harder having friends. So. I bullied my wife into not telling my daughter. And my wife was really on the, on the path of we should sit down, we should tell her. But I said, no, I think, I think she, can, she can survive. It's, it's borderline, I've seen how she is, she'll, she'll be fine. That was probably the worst decision I've ever made in that, in that scenario. But it was all framed through my own experience of life and, and who I am and who I, who I, how I manage things. And I think I represent lots of people out there, lots of people of my age and who are leading teams in technology and in other areas, I think have developed their careers thinking like me, of like push through the difficult times, um, adapt, survive, use your personality. So 
and sort of got you all here today to sort of help me, help us share that story out into the, the wider market. Um, to sort of roll on to the Eresy story, to the, the impacts that what uh, my decision made was, she wasn't able to talk to her friends, she, she didn't talk to her teachers. We got her some help to work with a psychologist who she would meet with every other week, but that psychologist was sort of, she described it to me as, Paul, I'm trying to fix things through the, through the door lock. She says, I can't, if I can't talk to her about it, it's very difficult for me. I was still resistant to that, that sort of word being used and her adopting that, that label. So school just got, as she got older, school got harder and harder and harder. Um, she found it harder to fit into the classroom. She found it harder to make friends. Everything became more and more complex. And until the point she left school, she got really no friends. Um, she was finding life really, really hard at that point. Um, it, it got terrible, but it got pretty dark. It got pretty dark in, in terms of how she felt about herself. And at that point, my wife managed to convince me to say, we need to sit down and we need to talk to her and she needs to know who she is. Um, and we did that. And that was the start of an enormous change, enormous change. Um, she could understand who she was. She could talk to her friends and her peers and her tutors about who she was. Um, and yeah, things didn't get brilliantly better overnight, but actually understanding who she was helped her then take some steps forward. Roll on forward into um, last summer when she wanted to come out of education. She was struggling to deal with college. She wanted to come out of education and get into the workplace. We started putting a CV together. Now, in, I don't know, two, three, four, five years ago, there is absolutely no way in a million years I'd have recommended to her to use the word autism in job applications. Like my DNA back then as a recruiter, I'd have been, all challenges. Like, yeah, and most employers, I think, would think, oh, challenges, that's going to be difficult. The first thing we did, opening line of the CV, um, yeah, my name's Eris, I have autism, I work hard to deal with the difficulties I face. And the impact of being able to do that, I think, have really helped her end up to where she is today. So we, I, I thought, where can we apply? M&S, Waitrose, um, all the posh brands that I thought actually would be <laughs> would be really nice places to work, kind, nice people. I didn't, that wasn't actually the case. Um, the, the Waitrose online assessment, for someone who's written, I have autism on the first line of their CV, is so backward to an autism person, it's unbelievable. Like it's an hour of asking you situational questions that she's like, what does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? She takes everything literally. I had to sit next to her. I did it, basically. I sat next to her, answering these questions. We got rejected. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I actually couldn't believe it. So I, I am not capable of getting a job on the shop floor at Waitrose. I'm really hoping this recruitment thing works out for me. <laughs> what did happen was she got a call from um, the, Soho, the Soho group. So she applied to Soho group. We're very lucky we live in... Um, near Banbury, which is near Soho Farmhouse. And if you know that, it's all the celebrities hang out there. It's, it's, it's super cool. It's uh, media, it's, yeah, it's a very, very cool place. So she applied there. She got a text to say, how best would you like us to communicate with you? She replied to that. They then set up um, a phone call. They then invited her in. They gave her the most detailed list of um, instructions of what would happen on that day that I've ever seen. It was incredible. The, uh, the potential manager came out, I picked her up in the car park office, came out, he introduced himself to me, he explained what would happen on the day and explained what would happen going forwards. They then made her offer for employment, inducted her, they adapted the induction process and then they've given her a mentor to work with in the first few months that she's been there. She had a real dip. Now, this is a, someone who suffers from anxiety. Communication is not easy for her, and she's going into the hospitality environment. She, uh, it, she struggled in the first few months, but they worked closely. They adapted her shift patterns, and they got her back into the workplace, in, and she's now working, yeah, her maximum number of shifts. What they've done for her is totally incredible. Now, that's a kind, nice thing, and I think everybody should be kind and nice. But actually, what have they got in that? Because I think this is a two-pronged two thing. There's the be nice part of this, and then there's the what do I get. 
what they've got, like hospitality is really well known for people uh, not being committed, turn, not turning up. Um, certainly if you're 18, going into a hospitality environment, you're not that confident to go out and talk to people. But what they've got in Eris is someone who, if there's someone not turning up, she'll go and do that shift. She, she is absolutely proud of that brand and proud of the organisation. She's super brave, like she's really comfortable going up to someone and saying, I like your dress, or yeah, I really like your tie. She's got that sort of, um, I can step over the boundaries where most 18 year olds can't. So they absolutely love her. They use her as front of house because she's out there just being kind and warm and nice to people where I think your average 18 year old will be a bit, oh, I'm not sure about that. So there's two sides to this. There's the being nice and there's the, the actually I think Soho group have got someone who's hugely committed. And she's really keen now that she gets on a progression track with them and moves through. Last week, they, they approached her and said, Eris, we're really happy. We've signed off for probation. And they put her on through an apprenticeship programme. They're going to support her learning. So I'm whew, super proud of where she is now. Oh, sorry. So...